The following interview was conducted with Henry T. Sampson, Jr., a uh, B.S. in Chemical Engineering from Purdue in 1956 and received of the Outstanding Chemical Engineer from Chemical Engineering in Purdue in 2009 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, um, October the 23rd, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Also sitting in is his wife, Laura. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. And good morning. Start uh, where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. I was born in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, April 22nd, 1934, at 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, my mother tells me the first uh, thing that I did uh, after the doctor came because I was born at home. And uh, the doctor lifted me up and he got sprinkled in the face. That was my first action. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, guys, right? That was my first action. In the world. I'm already so I got a little bit right, so I got started off on a good foot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, born in my uh, grandfather's home, uh, my mother's father's home, T.B. Ellis, at 518 West Pearl Street in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. That's the way I grew up, and my brother was born approximately 18 months after I was. And, in the same place, and um, my mother is a resident of, uh, born in Jackson, and uh, raised in Jackson. My father was born in Quitman, Georgia, and I was raised in Quitman, Georgia. Um, my grandfather on my mother's side was uh, born in Tillman, Mississippi, which is about 30 miles southeast of uh, Jackson, uh, southwest of Jackson, and um, I went to school um, at the, um, well, I, before I entered school, I went to uh, kindergarten uh, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, because in, uh, what we did uh, in 1934 is my father, who was a professor at that time of mathematics at Jackson State College, uh, decided that he uh, wanted to make earn a few more bucks. So he was offered a job at, as professor of mathematics at Savannah State College in Savannah, Georgia. And Jackson College is a historical, a black college in, in, in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we moved the family to, um, to uh, Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And you, did you uh, start school there then? I started my first grade uh, in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And, uh, now that was at a laboratory school. That was in a laboratory school on okay. the campus of Savannah. For the State. researcher, just tell a little bit that it was affiliated with the university. Is it was affiliated. It's, it's, so it's actually a, a Savannah. Savannah. It was called Georgia State College then. It was name was later changed, I think, in the 1960s, Savannah State, but then it was called Georgia State. Sure. And basically, it was a teacher training. It was another historically uh, black college, and it was a teacher training. So, on all of these teacher training schools, they had what's called a laboratory school where the senior uh, uh, teachers would come in and, uh, and prepare lesson plans and, and, and teach the uh, students, Good. and they were observed. And it was close to uh, where your father was employed, too. It was right yes, on the campus. Yes, right on the campus. On call. So my mother was employed. She worked in the campus bookstore. Oh, that, the family affair. So it was a family <laughs> affair. <laughs> oh, and then what came next? And you moved, you were there for a while, and then? So we um, yeah, were there for approximately four years. And um, my father got a call from Jackson State College again, and they offered him an even higher salary and uh, offered him a position of executive dean and professor of mathematics. So we, the family moved back to Jackson, Mississippi, back to 518 back West Street, Pearl Street, right. back to Jackson. Right. where I continued my uh, early education at the laboratory school on the campus of Jackson College. So uh, we You got indoctrinated to hire it early on. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> I, a, part of, a lot of my early life was spent in and around uh, the college. <laughs> right. So that was no, <laughs> no strange environment to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then uh, tell, tell us about high school. Well, you went to high school in Jackson as okay, well? Okay, uh, my high school, uh, my parents decided they wanted to send me to a private school. And uh, they uh, sent me to um, high school on the campus of Tougaloo College, which is another private uh, institution, another historically black institution about five miles north of Jackson and uh, I'm, yeah north of Jackson and um, I caught the bus every morning 
We did have busing in those days, but I caught the bus every morning, and I went over and and we uh, drove to the campus of Tougaloo, and I stayed at Tougaloo High School approximately two years. Okay. And actually two years, and my it was an excellent school, and it was there where I really learned for the first time that I had a special aptitude in science and mathematics. So I began. To, I became aware of myself that I was good at it. I liked it, and I couldn't get enough of it in terms of super. Uh, yes. So um, my brother and I took all of the uh, science and math courses offered at Tougaloo High, and we decided to transfer to a public school in Jackson, which offered a wider range of uh, courses in uh, science and math. And in fact, we persuaded our um, the principal to allow one of the teachers to teach us some extra math courses that not, were not being offered at the high school level. Super. So um, You were really looking ahead. Yes. Yeah, so he taught us courses like solid analytic geometry and things like that that were not being really offered as part of the high school. But we, there was only four, five, three or four students in the class, but the uh, mathematics professor took his homeroom time period and, and turned it into a class, right. a special class for us. Your father's position, did, well, executive dean, was it for academic affairs pretty uh, much? Or? Yeah, academic okay. affairs, right. Okay. He did most of the planning, the curricular uh, for the university, guiding a university along, I mean, the college along to the point where it became a university. Okay. And, so, what, and your mother was also uh, working My there? mother uh, was, uh, well, when my, my brother and I were born, my father, prom uh, my mother promised my father she would kind of stay near to the home until the children had grown up to an age where they were pretty well self-sufficient in terms of uh, taking care of themselves. And uh, then she would start a career. And she graduated from Jackson College. And she was originally going, going to go into teaching, but, but her mother was a um, community person and was very active in uh, helping, caring for wayward youth in Mississippi. So she observed her mother's activities. So she became very interested in, in welfare, for social welfare, Good. which inspired her. So she decided to go into that field. And then she went to Atlanta University where she got her master's, master's degree in social work and became the first professional African-American social worker in Mississippi. Very nice. So her story is a very interesting story too because the trials and tribulations she had in breaking into the environment uh, where uh, it wasn't all the time a very friendly environment yeah. and the things that she had to go through. But she did very well then. She was yes. able to persevere, which is great. Right. Yeah, right. It's very good. <laughs> any activities in high school? Were there any clubs or anything? Um, I. Um, How about athletics? Did they have any athletics? There? I uh, was always I was too small to play uh, football, and uh, and basketball, but I was always a pretty good sports person. So we have our we had our neighborhood baseball team, and I was a star Sounds pitcher. Sounds good. And um, in those days, uh, there wasn't any organized little league. We organized our own league. We bought our <laughs> uniforms and organized leagues, separated into teams, kept the scores, turned them in each week. There was no really adult supervision. So it's just a bunch of teenage kids doing sure. that. And uh, we had, and so we had regular games. So that's how we I participated in athletics. Sounds good. Okay. Then after, what came next after uh, uh, high school? Go ahead. Uh, basically. Um, the plan was that I would follow in my uncle's and my father's footsteps and attend Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. You might know that Morehouse College. That's where, is where they had gone. That's where they had gone. And uh -huh. that was a school that uh, Martin Luther King kind of made famous. But Morehouse was an excellent school and it was a school where... It's an older and long, long school. Been it was, a, it was a, his, another historically uh, black That's institution right. and um, had a very good reputation in most of the middle class families across the country, African Americans sent their children to Morehouse, Spelman, Atlanta University, Morris Brown College. They were all in the same complex in Atlanta, mm -hmm. which was a fairly progressive city at that time. Sure. So I followed in my father's footsteps, and fully intending to go into a course of uh, pre-med. Because in that time uh, period, um, really, if for an African American, if you wanted to enter professional life, really the, the avenues that people would, would think of, of going would be either you'd be a, a teacher, educator, or a lawyer, or a doctor. 
there were no engineers and there were no uh, technicians and that kind of thing sure. for African Americans available jobs available at that time. So I fully intended to go to Morehouse and pursue a career in, in medicine, preparing myself to go to medical medical school. And then we took a little bit of a switch, huh? Then we yes, uh, quite by happenstance, I happened to be in uh, at the end of my sophomore year at did Morehouse College. Did you live College. on campus? Excuse me, did you live on campus? Yes, I lived in. Uh, Graves Hall, which is old hall, same same residence hall my father lived in. <laughs> so, oh, great, that's nice. So uh, it, uh, I lived right on campus, and uh, it was a very uh, interesting experience being away from home under direct supervision of my parents for the first time. So I <laughs> got a chance. We to, all uh, experience that. <laughs> yes, right. So uh, I um, was able to. I was very inspired by Morehouse. I, that was where I really got a chance to see uh, uh, African Americans in positions and people who had attained real high uh, achievements academically. Because most of the professors that had graduated from Ivy League schools, Yale, Harvard, and the president of Morehouse was a uh, nationally known, nationally known, internationally known theologian, Benjamin E. Mays. And uh, he would give very inspirational speeches to uh, students of Spelman and Morehouse every Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, every Tuesday morning. So I, uh, at the end of my sophomore year in Morehouse, I, just out of curiosity, I decided to go to a, uh, a uh, I think it was a career day, what they call it at the time, where the, uh, for seniors, they would have the companies, various companies come in and uh, where the students could, they could tell the students, seniors, about the job opportunities in the various uh, areas of uh, science and uh, law and that kind of thing. So I popped my head in just out of curiosity to see what was going on because I was wondering, gee, I'm not doing the right thing going into medicine. So I happened to see a, um, a man standing over in the corner and nobody was talking to him. So I wanted to talk to him. He needed uh, some conversation. He needed some conversation. He had this table Make laid out with all of the, <laughs> right, with all of his papers on it. And I asked him <laughs> who, you know, what he said. I'm a chemical engineer. I said, what? What? What's what's an engineer? What's a chemical engineer? And he explained <laughs> to me that he was um, he was a graduate of Purdue, and uh, he was a chemical engineer, and he was working for Charles. I think it was Charles Pfizer company. At that time. Uh, at that time, sure. right. And I think it was out of Indianapolis, I believe. And uh, he explained to me what chemical engineering was, and I was fascinated because, I, gee, I had never heard of engineering. I didn't know what engineering was. Did Morehouse not offer any engineering at all? No, no. absolutely Did they have no. some science? They had science if you were in Oh, they had science. Oh, so, yeah, biology, chemistry, math, sure. that kind of thing, physics, uh, but no engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at that time. Sure. So... Um, <clears throat> I uh, finished the interview, but then that summer, later on that summer, I kind of like forgot about it. So I uh, took a summer job in Chicago that same summer, and uh, one Sunday morning I decided, uh, I remembered my conversation with the Purdue engineer, and I said, well, hey, wait a minute, let me go to Purdue and see what an engineering school looks like. I got Sunday off. So let me just go down here out of curiosity. Again, out of curiosity, let me go down here and see what it should it. produce. So uh, I jumped on up Greyhound bus early one uh, Sunday morning and I drove uh, down to uh, Lafayette. I think the bus stop was in Lafayette. Got off the bus. I said, ask a lady at the, at the uh, ticket place there, you know, where it's produced. She said, well, you know, you got to go walk three blocks that way and go over the bridge and then you'll and see the university. The <laughs> right. And so I did that, and uh, from the moment I set eyes on the campus, it was just like a revelation. I just loved it. I felt, I don't know, the feeling came over me that were I really belonged Were you able to talk to anybody here. when you came? Mm -hmm. Was there anybody around on a Sunday? I was oh. a Sunday, but there were, there were people on the campus. Okay. I didn't really talk to anybody, sure. but the okay. school was open, and uh, there were students, you know, on the campus. So uh, this it was the summertime. This summer, is during right. the summertime, right. Sure. But there was some some summer. School. But anyway, the union building was open, and uh, so I got a chance to walk all over the campus, and it was just thrilling to me. I had never seen a university of that size, you know, sure. the massive football stadium, and it was just an eye-opening experience. And I <laughs> and I uh, rode the bus back home, got off, and uh, I was living at the 50th. I was living at the YMCA in Chicago at 50th in Indiana, and. Uh, 
got back to the place where I was staying and I got on the phone. I didn't even go to the room, got on the phone and called my mother and father and say, I'm not going back to Morehouse. I'm going to be a chemical engineer. I want to go to Purdue. And uh, silence. And uh, they said, okay, well, we'll talk about it, you know, when, uh, when you get back to Jackson. <laughs> Parents so are ye- so alike. We'll so talk year, about it. Years later, they told me they were in shock, <laughs> but they didn't discourage me. They said, okay, we'll just talk about it when you get back, sure. okay? So when I got back home, we talked about it. And uh, they didn't dissuade me. And uh, so I, in the meantime, I applied to Purdue, and I was accepted Good. in the engineering school. And uh, so then we, my, families, my parents were, were uh, faced with the problem of paying, how were they going to pay for this? And uh, because at that time, even though my father and my mother were employed in Mississippi during the days of segregation, African Americans did make the same kind of money uh, that uh, white people made for this, doing the same kind of jobs. Sure. My father was a university professor, but he didn't make nearly as much money, and my mother was employed. So it's the question is, how are you going to pay for it? And then they had another son that also was going to be going to college in another <laughs> year or so. So um, my father found out that there was, there was a special program set up by the Mississippi legislature. And the program was uh, set up specifically to uh, circumvent the integration of Mississippi universities, white universities. And the program um, provided funding for students who wanted to pursue a course of study that was not being offered by the traditional African American sco- schools in Mississippi. So that since no engineering, there were no in black engineering schools in Mississippi, uh, and I had qualified to uh, to enter Purdue, sure. I was eligible to receive state aid from the state of Mississippi, and uh, which I, uh, paid uh, a good part of my tuition. Wonderful. Because being uh, out of state, the tuition is always Out higher. of state, right. Sure. So, um, when you look back at it, it's ironic that the state set up a program to provide me an engineering education which was far superior than any available to any white student in Mississippi. Sure. So it shows you how, uh, how nonsensical the system was in those days. Mm-hmm. They would do something like that. And yeah. they would, uh, so, but anyway, I benefited uh, from the system and I um, entered Purdue. And that was an experience. I Tell us a little about. Did you take? The, how did you get? Did you take the train, or how did you? Come? In those days, everybody traveled by train. Okay. And my mother. I uh, love trains. Yes, my mother would uh, take me to the train, and she would load me up with a box lunch of fried chicken and coconut cake because African Americans were, were not served in the dining coaches at that time, so we had to carry our own food with us. So we caught the train. But home cooking is quite good. The home cooking cooking is quite good. Better. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. So I rode the train to uh, Purdue, and um, in those days we would travel with a wardrobe trunk, big trunks. You know, you remember those big trunks, right? Where everything was in it except your, what you had in your suitcase. So uh, when I arrived on campus, so I received a big time shock because I didn't realize, realize at that time that the residence halls at Purdue were not integrated racially. So they didn't have a place for me to stay. What year, what did you, you graduate? This is 1953. 53, okay, because right. okay. you graduated in 56. Right, okay. this is 1953, and uh, so what they did was put, found me a place to sleep in the infirmary. So they said an infirmary building at that time was located between Cary Hall, I think it's west, and the stadium. It's not there anymore, but there was an infirmary there building. And, so uh, was, set if up, you were sick, you would go there? Is that you would what? go, yeah. When, okay. You know, for students who were <laughs> sick and needed to be kept overnight, and they had a bed, eight or ten beds, and they had a staff, a nursing staff. It was a regular, regular infirmary, you know. I understand. So I had my suitcase there, and <laughs> I was just sleeping there. So after a couple of nights of that, I was very discouraged, because after all this anticipation of coming to the university to find out that they didn't have a place for me to stay. Sure. So I was so discouraged, I decided to, hey, I'm just going to leave and go to uh, Wayne State University in Detroit. You've only been here a short time, I right? I've only been here a short time, right. <laughs> so I'm going to switch and not go to Purdue, and I'm going to go to uh, Wayne State and try to engineer, because my brother had enrolled in Wayne State University. And so I left Purdue, 
one evening, one night, and rode, rode the train all night and got to Detroit the next morning and got off the train. My mother, met, my brother met me at the station and we walked over to the campus of Wayne State University and I looked over there and I was very, very disappointed, disheartened because the facilities and the engineering setup was not near as good as uh, Purdue and had a very small engineering, uh, chemical engineering school at that time. So um, here again, I was very downhearted. So I got back on the train, came back to Purdue. And uh, had very you had a chance? Sleep. Excuse me. Had you had a chance to talk to a professor get enrolled? I mean, you'd been in when you first arrived at Purdue. Yeah. No. 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 They hadn't. You hadn't really been enrolled in yet. Right. Registered. I never. I never had really gone through the process of enrollment. I had done. I think I'd gone some total preliminary. You sent something set up some in advance. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I came back, but when I got back to the campus, I checked in with the housing office again, and they had moved, they had, they had found a space for me in some old army barracks, which World War II army barracks, which were on campus still. And I think they were located where this new building over here now is um, next to the um, chemical engineering building. They put it out to me the other day. It's, anyway, it's a series of kind of like old Quonset huts and has set it up to house, house students. So I was given a room in that facility for um, a week or so. And then um, in the meantime, I didn't know this, but Lamont Lundy had come on campus. He was Purdue's star African-American football player, first African-American star athlete that Purdue had competed because they were trying to compete with Michigan State and and uh, you know all the other schools of the Big Ten, which had African American players, so uh, they recruited Lamar Lundy, who was all Mr. Indiana, was all state he, football. He was and from basketball. Indiana, was he? He was from right Indiana, okay. right, and he was Mr. Indiana football and basketball. So uh, they had in those days the athletes stayed in the residence halls with the rest of the students, so they had to find a place for him to stay. So they so they put him in Cary Hall East. And uh, he had a roommate. He knew a, a friend uh, from Illinois, so they put him two together. So that way, the the Cary Hall. I think they were the first two African Americans that stay in Cary Hall complex. So uh, that kind of opened up Cary Hall. But I still couldn't move in because I didn't have a roommate, and they didn't want to mix African American roommate with white roommate. Okay, oh, so okay. so uh, African American student arrived on campus. And uh, they paired me up with him, and we moved into Cary Hall, the first floor of Cary Hall. And that's that was handy I, being on the first floor. <laughs> yes, that's how I got into into Cary Hall. And I found, for the first time, I finally uh, felt that I was pretty well settled. But the, one complicating factor is that my wardrobe trunk got hung up in Detroit because at a quick turnaround time, it got lost. And it wound up in a uh, lost trunk storage facility somewhere in Detroit. And so all I had was just one change of clothes and with me, and I was starting classes. <laughs> so fortunately, my roommate uh, let me a shirt, and, uh, a tie because you had to wear a shirt and tie to go down and, and have dinner every night at Cary Hall. In those days, the um, the cafeteria was on the in the basement of okay. each of the quads, and so it's very convenient. But but sure. the rule was that you had to wear a shirt and tie, so I had to borrow a tie from him and. Uh, and uh, the weather was turning chilly, and uh, it was getting a little fall, cold. This right. was in the fall, right? So fortunately, um, it was a requirement for all new entering students to take at least one semester of ROTC. So I enrolled in the ROTC, Air Force ROTC program. And they gave me a uniform, and part of that uniform was a heavy wool coat. So that <laughs> saved me. So uh, Warmth is coming. War, right. You know, you were, I was breaking regulations because you're not supposed to wear part of the uniform. I was against the regulation. You're not supposed to wear part of the Air Force uniform <laughs> with civilian clothes. But nobody challenged me. I walked out of the campus. Nobody challenged me. So. <laughs> they thought you were a visitor. <laughs> <Right>. Recruiting. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, in the meantime, I started my uh, classwork, but it was really amazing for me because um, it's kind of like culture shock because it was the first time I had lived in a integrated situation, okay, uh, because it, I had always lived in either all black kind of situations, and so I carry Hall was integrated. So, um, and I received another 
very surprised that uh, one morning I heard a knock on my door and um, I said, who is it? And uh, this lady said, I'm the maid, I'm coming to clean up the room. So in those days, you, you had maids, carry hall or maids in carry hall that would come in two or three times a week and straighten up your room and clean your room and dust and fuck lock the floors. So uh, that was a culture shot. That's uh, a lap of luxury. Uh, yeah, here's this, this white lady, okay, coming to my room and, and, and cleaning the room of African American, which whereas when I grew up, it was just the situation was just the opposite. Okay, African American people cleaned up the rooms of white people. I mean, there's no such thing as African American having a white base. So that was another little piece of culture shock. The other thing um, was was kind of an interesting uh, thing that I had to adjust to was that there were so few African Americans on campus. I remember I walked over Purdue's campus going to class almost a week, and I never saw another African American until one day I went to the Union Building. And I saw a group of African Americans because we had our own little spot that you could in get the together. union. We were all gathered together between classes. It was on the first floor up there near the spot where the map is, the three-dimensional map. It was up in the oh yeah, that's that's the spot that we would kind of gather and compare notes. There were only uh, 50 African American students, three of them, three female, and the rest male. Wow. And uh, some most lived on campus, but some lived in the community. So off campus over in Lafayette, uh, and uh, so it was. It was another little piece of culture shock. So, uh, but all in all, um, I think I adjusted pretty well. And did you uh, see? Did you get to meet uh, Lundy at all? Time? You must have seen him in the. Oh, Lundy! Oh, yeah, Lundy lived right down the hall. Oh, so he was on the same floor, the same floor with you. Yeah, right. So all of the African Americans knew each other. You know, okay. so, I mean, because it was all kind of stuck together because we had sure. compared notes, right? Did you, go, you didn't see him play? Did you go to the... To oh, the, yeah, I went to all the Purdue games. We never saw him win. <laughs> <laughs> but, it was but not Purdue, a good year. <laughs> right. But Purdue was kind of interesting at that time because um, it was going through a transition period. I know that in terms of African-American uh, students, uh, you still couldn't get your hair cut in a union. And... Uh, like somebody said yesterday, probably we didn't want to get our hair cut, but probably didn't because the barbers probably didn't know how to cut our hair. But anyway, we still all of the resident, all of the uh, pizza places and the beer parlors around the school where students go, and you know, they were not accept African American patriots at, hmm. at that time. So uh, we went across town to get into Lafayette to get our hair cut at a barber shop owned by African American lady, Mrs. Davis. I'm sorry, I. I don't remember her first name. Mm -hmm. She was a very, very nice person. She served kind of like our mother away from home, and she would uh, encourage us and that's nice and give us advice. You know? Give you a little boost. <laughs> give us a little boost when we or needed a little boost. We needed boost, a right? lot, right? Yeah, we needed a little boost. How were the courses? To, were you able to handle those pretty well? Do you think? Uh, that's that's that was that's kind of interesting too because I was not really prepared for engineering. Okay. Because she had engineering students that had had courses that I had never taken, and they had them in high school. So I had never prepared for that, but I remember my first class was a class, and we called it P-Chem, but it was physical chemistry. And it was taught by this brilliant professor by the name of uh, Dr. Herschel Hunt. Uh, brilliant you, professor. You mentioned that in the article. He's quite well known. Right, and he was kind of eccentric, though, the way he taught his classes and the way he's very strict. And uh, but I can always remember the first day after he had finished explaining how he would run a class and how he would give these quizzes and that kind of thing, he looked over at me and said, Henry, no, he said, Samson, you're the first African-American student I've ever had, and I expect you to be the star of my class the same way Lamar Lundy is the star of Purdue's football team. Oh, dear. So I'm sitting over there in the back, not knowing a brand new student, not knowing anything or anything. Why One of the students looking around Lord? at me, who is, who is he? <laughs> <laughs> who is he? And I'm going to speak to <laughs> And the very next day, uh, 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 Dr. Hunt gave a pop quiz. And uh, I knew the answers to the questions. So I was sitting here calculating instead of all this stuff and doing the numerical work. And uh, looking around, and uh, all of my classmates were were using a strange looking device, making these calculations, you know, and they finished. And I, I was not able to complete the, the quiz because I was trying to do the calculations by hand. So needless to say, I flunked in my first 
class, <laughs> my pop quiz. So, uh, so far, you know, being the star, that went down. I mean, the star of his class was kind of like dashed his hopes it was on the low end too, there. right? <laughs> but anyway, I got out of this class, and that was another thing I had to learn. I called my mother and my father and said, hey, I need a slide rule, I need a slide rule. So they wired me some money by Western Union. And um, I got the money and went down to the bookstore, I bought a slide rule, and stayed up half the night learning how to operate it. And then I was prepared for my next Now slide. you're in, in group. I'm in a group, I could wear it on my belt. <laughs> but still, I had a lot of catching up to do, so. so uh, but you think you felt comfortable with chemical engineering? I felt very comfortable with chemical engineering. I liked because chemistry was my favorite, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. But I needed to take um, the, the, uh, the uh, basics, some of the engineering courses that I had never taken before. And, you, and this was a competition in school, so I had a little rough time getting started. And, uh, and in the meantime, I didn't know uh, that my mother and my father were being sent mail these, ye what they call a yellow slips at that time. And a yellow slip was sent to the parents of a student who wasn't necessarily doing that well in their grades. Okay? I didn't know that I was, they were getting these yellow slips. And I did, really didn't know until I graduated from Purdue. And my mother said, yeah, we got these yellow slips, but we didn't tell you about it because we had full confidence. We knew you could, oh, we nice. could, do, you could do the work. Yeah. Nice. So what I did was I realized that I was behind and I was a lot of uh, preliminary uh, uh, engineering uh, courses that I, I, I uh, knowledge that I so I skipped football games and I skipped social events and I spent a lot of time in the library boning up sure. and gradually I was able to uh, get my grades back up to up to up to standard where I felt comfortable enough that I could engage in social yeah. participate yeah. right good. Then, uh, so you st after graduation, so it t what came next then? Let's well, it's very interesting about graduation because I spent f hard four years here in intensive study, and then comes the period where the company representatives come to the campus to interview prospective uh, uh, college graduates who are coming out and looking for jobs. So my intention was since I was from Mississippi, I wanted to go back to Mississippi to work, or somewhere as close to Jackson, Mississippi, for my family. And uh, so I wanted to work for one of the big oil companies like Shell, Texaco, which are located in Texas and Louisiana and that kind of So I interviewed these companies, and before, not long in the interview, uh, they would just tell you straight out that they were not hiring African-American engineers under no circumstances. <laughs> so that hope was dashed. So after I had spent three years here and uh, intensive study t to realize, hey, I might not be able to get a job in, in, in the kind of job that I really wanted. But it turns out that my last interview was, was with uh, uh, an engineer from the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station in China Lake, California. And China Lake, California was the main testing site for the Navy's, uh, for the fleet to, to check out new weapon systems development of new weapon systems. And there's also the place where the first um, non-nuclear components of the atomic, atomic bomb were made, because the facility was actually operated by the AEC back in during the war days of World War II, but then after, after the war, the Navy took it over. So it was an extensive facility. The, um, the Navy pilots would come out and do, gun, had gunnery ranges where you could practice bombing and, and uh, tactics, and they had a supersonic track where you could check out ejection seats, and, uh, seats technology. And, uh, but anyway, I was offered a job because I think one of the reasons I got the job because he had a hard time uh, recruiting uh, the other students coming out of chemical engineer because the salaries that they were offering at that time in civil service was only like four four thousand five hundred dollars a year, which was nowhere near what some of these other graduates yeah. were being offered For to companies. go to Dow Chemical <clears throat> and DuPont and those kind of places. So he needed engineers. So it turns out uh, the fact that I was not able to get the kind of job I wanted to, I wound up get, I wound up getting a job which was probably the best job I could have had a young engineer coming out of school. So here's another one of these kind of things that in life that you encounter first disappointment, but disappointment turns into an opportunity. That and you, you realize it more and more it. as you look back on it. And you realize it more and more right. as you look back on it. All right. So I got this job and uh, I drove back to Jackson. My mother drove me to New Orleans, put me on a Sunset Limited, going to California. And I had never been I don't think west of the Mississippi River, maybe over in Louisiana, maybe a couple of times. Sure. 
So I'm on this train and I'm looking at the scenery and the foliage turn from green to and trees to plains and greens and then to no green and to desert. I'm saying, what have I got myself into mountains? <laughs> so I arrived in Los Angeles and um, uh, stayed overnight at the YMCA. I called my mother and I told her, well, I arrived safely. And, and years later, she told me that she shed a few tears because she knew that I was so far from home and that kind of thing. So I got up the next morning, drove to uh, China Lake, which is located about 170 miles, 175 miles northeast of Los Angeles in the Mojave Desert. And uh, I got off the bus, and it was like 110 degrees in the shade. And I thought, to myself, what have I got summer? myself? And I can't stay here. I we got to earn just enough money to buy a car and go back to Los Angeles and try to find another job. So, but anyway, I was um, met by this at the at the gate there at this by well, the same engineer who recruited me at Purdue, and he showed me in, and we got a place to stay, and I got a temporary badge because the work there a lot of it was secret. And uh, so I had to get the security clearances. And uh, years later, again, my mother told me that the FBI came around the house and they were asking my friends. Even neighbors, in those days, they were things. doing checks like that, huh? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You had to get clearances and they'd check your background, check your friends and that kind of thing. So she said she didn't know what was going on. She thought I was in some kind of trouble <laughs> interviewing her and my friends. So anyway, I got my uh, security clearance. but. Um, I landed at the base there. Now, the China Lake was a civilian research center. Uh, they had both civilian and military personnel on the base. They had a base commander, and then they had a, a chief of the uh, technical arm, which was uh, McLean. And it was a facility that um, was very tense. It was almost like a university laboratory environment. The engineers were highly motivated. and. Um, Sounds like a good thing to move into. Yes, it was moved into that. And in my first three or four months, I was they had what they call a training program where I would work from in various departments to give me a kind of an overview of what was going on at the base. And uh, there was a lot of activity going on there. There was the uh, Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile, which is a very, uh, which is a missile that's been very effective by the Navy and by the Air Force, just being developed on the base there. First uh, missile that had an infrared heat seeker guidance system, very complicated uh, guidance system, and it's very sophisticated. And that was being done in China Lake at that time. I didn't work on that because, but anyway, I finally wound up in the, what they call the Propulsion Development Department. And I wound up at a time, uh, about six months, let's see, nine months after I'd gotten there, the Soviets launched the first the satellite. Sputnik, the Sputnik thing? The Sputnik, right. Okay. I think that was in um, 1957. Right. right. And that set up the space race. And that was, uh, it's not very well known, but there was a lot of competition between the Army and the Navy and some elements, uh, I think NASA, to launch, be the first one to launch the satellite. So officially the Navy was out of the competition, but the Navy got in, they sneaked in because they had, they had a secret project which they felt that they could convert over to uh, launch the first satellite. And the way the Navy was going to do it, instead of launching it on a booster, like normally you, you normally do, you launch a booster and it goes up and it releases the satellite. What the Navy was going to do, we were going to modify a smaller rocket, four-stage rocket, and strap it on the bottom of a F um, Skyhawk fighter and carry the fighter up to um, about 40,000, 50,000 feet and uh, get it up to Mach, near Mach 1 and release the rocket, which was always traveling at the same speed, and the while it would peel away, and the rocket would, uh, would the boosters would fire off and place it in the orbit. I think there were five or six attempts made, but we never got any ver verifiable um, uh, evidence that the satellite was placed in orbit. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, von Braun and his team down at Huntsville launched the first Pioneer, which was the first American spacecraft, and so that w our program. Uh, but it's a very exciting time for me to be involved in because I was involved in trying to modify the solid propellant rocket, and we had a round of clock activity, 24 hours, seven days a week. It was very exciting. The guy very intensive. Out of it. Very intensive, right? Very intensive. And in those days, engineering was a lot different from now. You could get a job, get an idea, 
something that you wanted to do, a test you wanted to run, you could write it up on a piece of paper and take it over to the machine shop and get it made and go out to the field and test it in static test facility. So it was very hands-on kind of work. Very good. But uh, shortly after that project was done, because I had taken some, as an elective in, uh, in uh, chemical engineering, I had taken in my senior year a course in polymer chemistry. And because I had, had that background, they assigned me a, uh, the task of trying to solve a problem which they had not been able to solve, i.e. How, um, how to bond a uh, cast composite propellant on the inside of a steel rocket motor without it separating. And nobody had been able, they hadn't been able to do that yet. So they said, okay, here's your own laboratory, uh, fully equipped, all the chemical storage, and a little machine shop, and a hood. You go out there and you solve this problem and see if you can figure out a way to line this rocket motor tube with an inert polymeric material so that we could place a mandrel in it and cast the propellant and cure it and it was separated because if the propellant separated from the grain and you put the nozzle on and you fired it, it would blow up. And that's not too good for uh, combat operations if you're trying to fire a missile on your fighter plane and it blows up in your face. So that wasn't a very good idea. So I worked um, very late in the day, seven days a week in my own laboratory out in the, out in, stuck out in the boondocks. Uh, on your own? There was nobody on helping you? On my own, it? no. There was nobody out there except me. And um, it was about, I guess it's located about 10 miles. Bas first of all, these little laboratories were separated from each other because they were, were the work that was involved there was highly using highly explosive and corrosive chemicals. So they didn't want you, they couldn't group these little laboratories very close to each other. So my little lab was separated about five miles from my office, but they gave me a Jeep. I had my own little Jeep I could check out every day and drive it out and park. <laughs> but we had to wear uh, conductive shoes so it wouldn't billow sparks and wouldn't set off ignite uh, ammonium perchlorate. We had to wear fireproof overhauls, safety goggles, and we wanted to wear a hat. So back when I look at those days and I hear I was working in the laboratory by myself, if something had happened, you know, I would have been <laughs> been a, a, a in danger to my uh, health to say the least. But anyway, I finally figured out a way to uh, make a long story short to how to uh, first coat the inside of this metal rocket tube they're going to cast with an inert liner and then coat that liner with a um, developmental adhesive uh, of a special type and then uh, cast the propellant in the tube, let it cure and and then in that process, when that process was finished, if there were any separation, it wouldn't be between the uh, propellant and the rocket motor tube. It would be, be between the um, inert liner and the tube, which was no problem. So after I was able to achieve that, I wrote up the process, what they call a standard operating procedure, SOP, and I published it for industry. And uh, my process was used uh, by industry. And uh, at that time they were developing, the Navy was trying real hard to develop a solid rocket motor that they could fire out of a submarine. It's called Polaris. And the submarines were being fitted so they could go out and store these rockets on board. So the P Polaris missile, okay, and the um, Thiokol, I think, was building the booster, and GE was building the warhead, and some other people were building the uh, <coughs> guidance systems. But anyway, my system was sent out in industry to be used to modify however, however they wanted to do, but the basic technique was the same, and, uh, and that was the basis for my first patent. I found a patent for that process. And later on, a very similar process not for the liner, but uh, an inert chemical material that could be mixed with uh, um, ammonium perchlorate and uh, various other uh, ingredients that you need to make up a, a propellant. It was inert material, very cheap. So I got a second patent on that on that one. So, was the uh, patent process a little bit easier in those days? No, well, you just really need to, I, I wouldn't say it's, it was easier because you had to still go through the same process. Okay. But okay. the Navy took part of the legal 
the naval staff took part of the they the yeah, civilian end took part of the uh, the legal part of it. Sure. All we had to do is right up and do the technical the technical part. So actually the, the Navy had rights what? the Navy had all rights to the sure. to the patent. Right. So they could do whatever they wanted with it because it was developed under their sponsorship and right. financing. Okay. So about that time, I decided that I wanted to expand my academic base. So I decided to get a master's degree. At that time, uh, so I started taking classes at night. And uh, uh, the U.S. Naval Audits Test Station had a degree at UCLA that their engineers could study, work study on campus, I mean at, at, at uh, Chatter Lake, and get a degree through UCLA. So I took night classes at night. But my thesis work had to be done uh, in conjunction with the professor at UCLA. So every other week I would travel to UCLA and meet with my thesis professor and report on my thesis. So I was able to um, to get my thesis, and I think it was around 1962. In the meantime, I got married to my first wife, and we had uh, uh, a son. And then we decided that we wanted to uh, go into uh, I get a PhD, and uh, even though I could have stayed at Knott's and done very well, I've probably been promoted many, many times. While I was there, I promoted about six times. I started out as a GS-5, and by the time I left, I was GS-13, which is, which is making pretty good money. But I, I really wasn't satisfied, and I wanted to explore another uh, academic area, so I decided, because I had taken, and he, here at uh, Purdue again, I had taken a course in introductory nuclear engineering, and I wanted to, very, became very interested in nuclear engineering. I, t I felt that I had done a lot in rocket propulsion. I knew how rockets operated. I, could, I understood how they operated, and uh, it was just a matter of refining techniques. Sure. So I felt that I wanted to expand out in another area. So we decided to um, go to the University of Illinois, and uh, where I earned my, uh, I entered uh, the nuclear engineering program. And I selected Illinois at that time because they were the only a campus in the U.S. that had a one megawatt react active reactor on campus. It's deactivated now, but at that time they had a had a mm -hmm. uh, actual reactor on campus, teaching research reactor right. on campus. So um, we um, uh, packed up our luggage and drove to uh, Champaign, and, and that took five years. We. Spent, we stayed there five years. Because you got both your master's and your PhD there. I got a, a master's in nuclear engineering. It's just, about, it's just a matter of process you get a master's because you finish a certain amount of work and you qualify for a master's, so you get a master's. <laughs> okay. And you go on and get your PhD. Uh, but but that you were was the first probably one in uh, first African American to get your PhD in nuclear engineering. I think I was the first African American to get a PhD. In, they, they were telling me that I might have been the first African American to get a PhD in nuclear engineering anywhere in the country. That's what I've, I've read. Right. right. That's very nice. Right. Congratulations. And uh, I have mixed feelings about that because um, I feel that um, there's something lacking that we need to improve in the American, African American community, getting young people to become interested in engineers to uh, follow in my footsteps. And uh, I was very surprised to learn that we were back at Illinois last um, March. I think the second uh, African American to come to the program on the verge of getting a PhD was an African American lady, young lady, hmm. to get a PhD in nuclear engineering. So, on the one hand, it's, it's interesting that I was first and only, but on the other hand, it's, it's very disturbing to me because uh, you would think that during that period of time, 20, 20 years or so, that other African American students would have been interested. Would have been interested in that, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Then after that, is that when then you went to the Aerospace Corporation? No. Uh, yeah. No. After I got my PhD, did you not want to go into teaching? No. No. Oh. no I never had a really interest in teaching. Okay. Uh, uh, I I, well, I I had financed my education at least at at uh, Illinois at least the first three years because I was on a Navy Educational Fellowship, and my agreement with the Navy it was come back to China Lake because they had paid me half of my salary. Sure. And my agreement would, would to come back to them and work for at least three years until I kind of made the equivalent, made up for the money that they spent. But somehow the Navy made a deal with the Air Force. And um, the Aerospace Corporation, which, which, which operated on the Air Force contract, 
okay, recruited me. So the, relay, so the Navy released me from my obligation, so I hired in with the Aerospace Corporation, oh, nice. which worked under Air Force contract. It worked almost, it was kind of like a technical arm of the Air Force. When the Air Force wanted to procure an advanced uh, ballistic missile or an advanced satellite system, they would use aerospace as a technical arm to help them write the proposal, help them evaluate the contractors, monitor the contract, uh, do independent studies and research at the same time. So we were co-located with the sure. Air Force Corporation. Okay. I mean, uh, at the Air Force. And, uh, so I went to work with them, and the, uh, the uh, Aerospace Corporation was very anxious to get an uh, African-American which had a PhD in uh, nuclear engineering. So we moved to El Segundo, California, and uh, I, told, I told Aerospace that I would come back and work for them because I knew there was housing problem with the El Segundo and the beach cities, and there were not, there were no housing available for African Americans. So I said, "Hey, look, I will come back and work for you if you find me a place to stay within five miles of uh, of where the company is located." Okay. So at that time, uh, in the area where I live in uh, El Segundo, it's called the South Bay region. It's Manhattan Beach, El Segundo, Hermosa Beach. And they had formed a, both white and black, had formed what's called a South Bay Fair Housing Committee. And the object of that committee was to research housing. So they would pair teams, you know, black, black, uh, white, white teams that go to various around and, uh, and, and test and, and identify areas with housing discrimination. So, but um, it turns out that there was a lady in El Segundo who was a paraplegic and who ordered to move to Mexico to get better, better care, and she was a member of that committee. So she agreed to lease us her house. And uh, some years later, I learned from a colleague of mine who lived in El Segundo at that time that before we got there, the word spread that, that African Americans were moving into El Segundo. And that was right after, about a year after the Watts riots. So there was a lot of tension that was built up. Oh, when wow. they, but surprisingly so, we moved into the um, neighborhood and we had no problem whatsoever. The kid, kid went out and brought other kids back to the house and the parents followed them and back and so we had no problems. We had absolutely no problems except one incident where where we got out one morning and found that people had somebody had thrown rotten eggs on the house, you know, the egg, what they call egg in your house. And we, I called the police and I told them, hey, I want to protect my family. And if anybody can come by here and messes with my family, I'm going to shoot them. I didn't have a gun. So after that, we <laughs> I'm had prepared. no problem. Yeah, we were all right. So after that, we had no problem. Sure. Okay. How old were your children at that time? I had one child uh, and uh, who was about, let's see, four years old, five years old. Uh -huh. And then soon after we moved back, we had another child the following year. Were the schools and, in, uh, close to where you lived to the as well? El, the uh, school in El Segundo was uh, right down the street. It was in walking distance from the house where we lived. And excellent schools because El Segundo is, uh, and I just learned recently that El Segundo be the second, and, and what the second meant was that that was the second refinery for our, uh, Standard Oil in mm. California. So it was a very rich community. They had a Standard Oil refinery next door, right. and that paid the taxes for the school. So it had an excellent school system. Mm, that's good. Okay. Uh, let's talk um, about the, uh, the author. You're interested in the, some of the books and the film uh, things that you've done. Uh, you've written a couple of books about the, the source book on black films. You have sort of an interest in that. Uh, and yeah. Something I, I read reminded me, excuse me, a little bit of myself. You like to go to the movies, and so did I. When we yes. used to go for like 10 cents a day. Or 10 right, cents, you know, was, right, yeah. We had to go Saturday and Sunday because they had different cereals on uh -huh. different days. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, my brother and I, we were little, little kids. Uh, we had a grandfather who, a godfather, who, worked, who lived right across the street. And every Saturday he would pick us up and carry us down to the Saturday matinee, and we could get in for six cents. <laughs> Right, and you can see your prices uh, were better. <laughs> you can see two films, a newsreel, a cartoon, and a short subject called travel log. Or something. So you can spend most of the day. So we probably I were there a, at the same time. <laughs> right. So I became a uh, movie buff, but uh, during that period of time when I was and I was growing a little bit older, we go to the movies. And when I was as a, a young teen, I would 
see uh, films uh, depicting African Americans, which were, even though these characters were funny and actors were very well done, they were mostly portrayed as maids, buffoons, and that kind of characterizations. Hmm. And uh, but. Maybe once a month or once or every other month that a movie would come to town and would be shown with an all African American cast. Hmm. Okay. And in those movies, African Americans were depicted as uh, lawyers, doctors, clowns, crooks, the whole spectrum. Okay. And I thought that was very, very unusual. So uh, in the latter stages of uh, my research at uh, Illinois, I started asking myself how many of these movies were made and how many. And the University of Illinois has an excellent microfilm department. And uh, I found out that the information regarding these movies was totally absent from the major periodicals like uh, Film Daily, uh, Variety. Sure. Okay, didn't cover any of that stuff. Huh. So, but yet they uh, were being made and shown. Yeah. So. Um, they were called independent films at that time, we made, and they were made to be shown in all black movie theaters to mm. all blacks. They were not distributed in white theaters. And uh, so I started researching it. How many were, you know, using the various methods of scientific inquiry, which I would very well honed by that time, right? <laughs> how many were made? When did they start making them? Uh, how much did they cost? Uh, were there any theaters owned by African Americans? I mean, you know, so that, that kind of stuff. And I started collecting information. And living in the uh, Hollywood area, I would go around and uh, and I found a place in in um, Los Angeles, old movie collector store, which had a lot of these posters oh, dating from the 30s and the 20s of all black cast films. Wow. So I found, yeah. found that. So well, I started collecting. Trope. So I started collecting. And in those days, you could collect these things like six or seven dollars per one sheet. Okay, a lobby cards. And I, then I started collecting the film. And gradually, over a period of about a couple of years, I had this massive amount of information. I said, let's see, well, does this, can I organize this in some way and document it and put it together? And wouldn't it make sense to write a book on this? So first I did the research to find out whether any other people had written any books. And there were other, there were other books which had mentioned, but they were kind of like skirted it, you know, and uh, skirted the area in, any, any, in a fair amount of detail. So being the uh, naive person I am, I kind of, at least in this area, I said, well, I'm going to write a book because I know everybody's interested in this. So I'm going to take my ass and write this book. So I put this book together and... Uh, and submitted it to, oh, I guess, roughly about 50 publishers, and they all rejected. And I said, what? You're not interested in that one? That's, and they were sending you this letter saying, this book does not fall within the category of our <laughs> current interest. Form so, letter one, two, or three. Right, yeah, right. So, but then I found this publisher called Scarecrow Press. And I said, oh, yeah, please, send us the manuscript, and we are interested because it falls right into our category of interest because they specialize in film and those kind of yeah. okay. right exactly so the book was published in 1975 six I believe seven and now in the course of doing this research oh by the way let me jump back and just say I, I was surprised to find out as I mentioned earlier that the uh, standard periodicals and sources you would think, like the Motion Picture Academy of Sciences, the uh, American Institute, Film Institute, the Library of Congress, would have a lot of information on this, but they didn't. Hmm. However, I remembered when I was in Morehouse, my mother and my father subscribed to African American newspapers, Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, and they would bundle these up every after so many weeks and send them to Morehouse. And I became an avid reader of African American newspapers mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, they were out of date. But I remember looking through an entertainment session, just things kind of like sticking to me. I would see advertisements of these African American films. Be in the newspaper. Like, in, in the newspapers. And I said, oh, maybe that's. So, University of Illinois has excellent, like I said, microfilm. Uh, so, they had the, the Pittsburgh Courier dating way back, African American uh, Norfolk Journal and Guide. 
Amsterdam News yeah. was another one. Yeah, yeah Amsterdam News, uh, the uh, New York Age. Right. Okay, the uh, L.A. Sentinel, uh, those guys, all over, Houston Chronicle, all over the country. And so I started periodically, starting from 1910, when movies start being made, going through each and every issue. Wow. Okay. Issue by issue, all of these newspapers and Xeroxing and going through a microfilm. And I spent weeks and hours on the weekends uh, just, uh, doing this work and accumulating this information. And, and, if, and right now I am indebted to the African American newspaper. I'm, I'm sorry to see a lot of them like newspapers are disappearing. But that, if you want to go to any source in the country and find out about life in the black community from a black perspective, African-American newspapers are where to go. It's well, not the L.A. Source. Times, the New York Times. Uh, you have That's to go. the source material for that. That's the source of material, right. right. So I collected this information, and like I said, I had bundled it all up, and I thought I had something that was worth publishing, and eventually it was published. And then, But in going through these newspapers uh, and looking for film stuff, I would see mention of uh, biographies of some of the people who appeared in the films back in the 30s. In their careers, and these people were mostly stage people, and a lot of them had backgrounds in minstrel shows, medicine shows, okay, uh, vaudeville. Right. Because they were stage people, cabaret people, live people. And they did these films kind of like a lot, but they're money. So I, became, so I started on the side collecting information about minstrel shows. You know, going back to right at the start of the Civil War. Because I wanted, when did the first African Americans start appearing on stage? And it was like actually in minstrel mm -hmm. shows. And white people had done this kind of stuff before then in blackface. So um, that led to my second book. Okay, and then in, in, in the research in the second book, I uh, ran across African American appearance in radio and TV. And eventually I started collecting from it, and that led to a third book. And then I remember these animated cartoons that I would see when I was a little kid featuring Bugs Bunny and some of the other Warner Brothers cartoons that featured some very ugly stereotypes of African Americans. Okay, and um, I remember those, so, and I started collecting information on those, and that led to another book. So one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. That's the thread. That's the thread, right. right. So before you know it, you know, I had lined up, lined up these books. <laughs> so, and in the meantime, uh, after the book was published, uh, suddenly uh, it opened up a whole area of research all over the country, across, across the country. People became interested. Oh, these films were being made. And so everybody became an instant expert in African American, these early films, right? <laughs> so um, uh, you started having seminars and you had film uh, uh, studies and setting up at these various universities right, to study this genre, okay, and Oscar Michaud and these other early black American films. And I'm glad of that because that was the purpose of my book, to open this up right. to people so they could do additional research. Because there's a lot out there. Right. And in, uh, and in the meantime, the movies themselves and the posters, which I could buy for 2 and $3, suddenly shot up to hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. Very rare 1921 stone lithograph posters. And if I had only known then, I would just collect it all of them if I could find, you know. <laughs> so, but I did have a, I did collect a very massive piece, piece of information. And um, right now I'm in the process of cataloging that information because it's going to be given to the Jackson State uh, University Library, which is named in honor of my father, H.T. Right. Samson said, Library. Right. right. Very good. Uh, what, uh, we're going to ask you, you're a technical consultant for the historical black colleges and universities. You make a comment on that. What Are you still involved with that as a technical consultant to the historical uh, black colleges and universities program? I think that must mean in the area of film. Okay. 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 And because, I, because I have done um, myself and some uh, pioneer African-American actors who lived in, in Hollywood, who were involved, directly involved. I became very good friends with them. And that's another advantage of doing this because it expanded my, word, my world of, from the engineering people, I met the engineers, to other 
Right. of people, okay, and, and it opened up a whole new universe because actors and actresses are completely different. The whole approach in life, outlook on it, completely different, but I was very lucky that the people I interfaced with were very, very nice. That's good. And um, well, I would interview... Look, we on the red carpet one of these days, huh? Yeah, there. right. <laughs> so I would interview people like uh, Alvin Childress, who appeared in an old Amazon and the TV program, and they would invite me into their homes. And uh, so I met with... I struck up a very good good friendship with a couple of these guys, and they were elderly at that time, they were in their 70s, and sure. we would go around to UCLA, and, and I would show films with them in it, and we would lecture, do a lecture. So maybe that's what you're talking yeah, that about. Could very, that could be. Some of the awards that I'd like to talk about, let's start with the Outstanding Chemical Engineer. You want to make a comment on that from Purdue? Yeah, I was very surprised, and I'm not really sure uh, how I became a candidate for that, but I was very honored. Congratulations, uh, it's it was, very uh, nice. It was, it was, I was very honored because uh, Purdue is an excellent school, and to think that I would be selected as one of their, out of the many graduates who have achieved uh, a lot, okay, and I was very and I was very honored to be associated with my co-awardee, who is a lady, uh, I'm not bet good at names, but anyway, she, um, she was an astronaut. She had flown a couple of times on the space shuttle. Okay. So there were two of us. So we uh, had a banquet last night, and uh, they had a big cake, and we had the students there, and we had a question and answer session. And all in all, it was a wonderful uh, experience of interfacing. I even met one of my old uh, chemical, the last one left chemical engineer professors, who actually taught me the polymer chemistry course that I had That's the information I had used. Who was used. that who was there? Uh, Ashford, I believe his name was. Oh, okay. Right. Oh. He's right, and he was, and and uh, I I did recognize him at first, but uh, so I met him. Yeah, I think he was the last one left that I was that was there when I was here in 1956. That's great. Yeah. And you got the uh, alumni award for distinguished service in the University of Illinois. Yes, it was the same kind of thing. I I I uh, I uh, there was a little bit more straightforward because for some reason they the alumni. Associate so had contacted uh, this uh, this uh, writer and asked him to do an article on me, which was published in the uh, Illinois the alumni publication. The alumni association built their publication. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, so they came to the house. She came to the house and interviewed me. We spent about three hours and interviewed me, and then they sent a photographer around. And I guess. The circulation because universities read other university materials, and I think that's how Robert Purdue became aware, you know, that I was still living in whatever, and then so they decided they, they knew then that that may have been a, you know, a candidate yeah, know. for their award. One of the things that's nice that Blacks in Engineering Applied Science Award and Prize for Education from the Los Angeles Council of Black Professional Engineers. Yeah, yeah that, you were the first one for that. I, I was not the first one was, for that, I okay. was the first one for the. Um, Robert H. Herndon Award okay. for uh, Aerospace right. Corporation. Right, for Aerospace, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that award was uh, named in honor of uh, Bob Herndon, who, who was uh, the first African-American manager at Aerospace Corporation. And he was uh, kind of like a mentor of mine, because I came in, and he kind of took me in his wings because that's a and uh, kind of mentored me my first couple of years there in aerospace because there's a lot you know when you go into a corporate environment there's a lot of minefields that you can step in so he kind of kind of let me know we what need was going mentors on they're very himself. good right. like peers exactly <laughs> so uh, but he passed away of cancer oh. about a year or so after I got that so so um, in Af African American special. History Month they decided to set up this award. And give it and then give it to uh, one of the engineers uh, there at Aerospace Club. So I received the first award. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, and you got some Atomic Energy Commission honors between '64 and '67. Yeah, well, uh, the, um, the AEC AC, gave right. me a fellowship to uh, so I could complete my last two years at Illinois. I was there at the Knotts Fellowship for my first two years, but I got an AEC fellowship, and uh, they were interested in my thesis, which was uh, direct conversion of. Uh, of uh, nuclear energy to uh, electrical energy, and let me just make one comment as a side. Mm -hmm. If you go, if you Google my name on the internet, okay, that's a good chance that it's going to come up. Henry T. Sampson, inventor of the cell phone, and as a matter of fact, it came up during my introduction last night. That is 
untrue. <laughs> and I don't know how that... How did that sleep in? I don't know that I had it came out. And I think it came out because somebody saw that I had to get the, the gamma Photo. electric cell. But and not connected cell together with, with cell the phone. cell phone. And at two completely different principles they operate on and had nothing to do. And I, I assure people, if I had invented the cell phone, I would own an island someplace <laughs> in the South Pacific. We would be right? down there. Yeah, right. We would do <laughs> conduct this interview on this island. <laughs> You'd even pay for my travel. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's talk about family. Do you, um, you have Laura? And where are the children now? My, my children, uh, one of them is uh, in Los Angeles, and the other one is in living with my, uh, not living with my mother, but living in Spokane, Washington. Okay. And uh, my ex-wife is uh, living in uh, Spokane. She has, she's retired now. Uh -huh. We were divorced in 1974. Um, I, got, I was remarried a uh, couple of years ago. Uh -huh. Okay, and then she's sitting right there. She's smiling over there. She's smiling. Yeah, Laura, with her Purdue regalia. Yeah. Laura's right. Laura and she's uh, and we've been happily married now. We got married in um, the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. And didn't have to go far for the honeymoon then, right? We didn't have to. We were right there <laughs> at the honeymoon, right? And as a matter of fact, we bought uh, a condo there. And uh, so we go over there a uh, couple of weeks every year. Oh, that's nice. And, and, and rent it out and uh, so I have another family now in Los Angeles. I have uh, wonderful grandchildren and, and, uh, and uh, son-in-law, daughter-in-law. So I'm settled down into a new mode of operation. <laughs> I was going to ask you what golf. you're doing now in your retirement. I'm retired and what I'm doing, I'm still doing research. Scarecrow Press just contacted me three, three weeks ago. They want me to do a second edition of one of my earlier books. You're good. So I'm cataloging my collection and preparing it. I'm playing a lot of golf. And I'm uh, enjoying, uh, enjoying life. Enjoying living. In closing, any, uh, as you look back or look ahead, I'll leave the final remarks to you. I would like to uh, in closing, something that I, I may not have covered that you'd like to. Yeah. Well, I would just say in cover, I think uh, the key, key uh, pieces of my personality, I think, which has probably influenced me, has been, number one, an uh, innate curiosity of, uh, about new things. Because if you look at my it, life, a lot of— It has to be innate. Right, right. right. Uh, if you look at my life, a lot of career paths, paths, life paths have been made because I was curious about something that I didn't know anything about. And I was on one path, and, and finding it out, it my total my life shifted. Um, I think that in the fact that I'm always interested in learning new things. And I think that uh, when I reach the point in my life that I'm not able to uh, have new intellectual challenges, I think that I will just lose interest in life. Yeah. That's, that's what really motivates me in terms of everyday, you know, day-to-day -day living. It's so. a very good thing to keep moving like that. Yes. That's very good. And to have that perspective. Yes. Yeah. And we hope you come back and visit us. I expect to. Okay. As the 50th anniversary, I think, in two years from now. I think it's, what? A couple of years. 100th? Okay, it's so on 100th year anniversary. <laughs> okay, in two years from now. So I'll be coming back for that. Right. I, I think will, of the nuclear will, engineering school. Okay, I will mark that on my calendar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. I'm of the chemical engineering school. I'm sorry, yes. not nuclear engineering school. That's chemical. very nice. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank you, thank Laura. You.